Welcome to Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoScheduleman.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. The question this week is, how are you going to respond when adversity strikes? And what about when it strikes again after that, and then again after that? How many times are you willing to get back up? Welcome. I'm Kevin Bulmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring conversations on personal and professional growth, authentically sharing in an effort to empower each other. Thanks for listening. You can find all past episodes of this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Google Play Music in the United States, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you find it helpful, please do subscribe. I also invite you to stay up to date by joining my free email newsletter. You can find that at kevinbolmer.com. Now, as to where we started. Adversity. I would have been 20 years old when today's guest, Gerard Ward, was named the Naismith Player of the Year in 1994. That means Gerard was ranked as the number one high school basketball player in all of the United States. That's a big deal. And it's a lot of pressure. I remember it well. I followed U.S. college basketball pretty closely at that time. And I well remember when Gerard chose to attend the University of Michigan, a basketball power in that era. Gerard seemed destined, not just for college basketball stardom, but for a long NBA career as well. But it didn't quite work out that way. Injuries derailed Gerard time and again. After multiple knee surgeries, he described himself as not only physically, but also mentally broken down. Gerard gives a vivid and moving account of those days in our discussion. Amazingly, he somehow persevered and went on to play. Let me try that again. He went on to play professionally for 14 years at the highest levels worldwide. And through it all, the adversities have taught Gerard to never give up. He now has gone on to motivate and educate people with his keystone philosophy, which he also calls NBA, the top level of the sport that he loves so much. But in this case, NBA stands for never be average. When Gerard talks about eating adversity, he means eat. E-A-T is an acronym for embrace, act, and thrive. And he talks about that in our discussion. Now, in addition to his speaking, which he does now, Gerard still stays close to the game that he loves. He's a college basketball analyst with networks, including ESPN. Some of the key takeaways from this chat with Gerard include, number one, the kids are watching. Please listen closely to what Gerard shares about his dad and how what he learned from his dad carried over into his own journey. If you have kids of your own, I'm going to ask you to please consider what they may be seeing and learning from you. In Gerard's case, it sounds like he had a pretty exceptional teacher. And you'll hear how huge, how massive, how incredible of a help that was. Number two, you're not going to get it all at once. Again, Gerard's father played an important role in showing him that the way things unfold is a process whether it's in achieving a goal or looking at the arc of your journey through life, you're not going to get it all at once, nor should you. And Gerard got some great lessons in that early on that, as you'll hear, played out in a, we'll say, I guess, a, a, an interesting fashion as far as the rest of his life has, uh, has unfolded. Number three, life will take you where you're supposed to go. So the Gerard suffered through near unbearable disappointment and physical and mental pain through the injuries that disrupted his path to the NBA. His journey diverted him to one of experiencing different cultures internationally and uniquely shaping him to empower other people to overcome adversity in the manner that he does today. He also mentions how it was predicted early on in his church 
that he may well someday be doing something very similar to what, in fact, he's actually doing now. They talked in those days about him maybe being on a platform, but he admits to, quote, running from what he was told. So it's interesting how life works out and how life will take you to where you're supposed to go, even though you may not be able to see it at the time that you're going through the adversity. This really is a remarkable story, and Gerard does such an incredible job to share it so openly and so transparently. I know that you're really going to enjoy it. Here is Gerard Ward on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Gerard, you now have the benefit of hindsight and experience to draw upon. So I'm going to have to ask you to use your imagination and tap back into some old feelings and ideas to try to answer this question. But I'm wondering if you, as best you can, can take me back into 1994 and give me an idea of how you were feeling and what you were thinking about yourself and your path when you were named the Naismith Player of the Year. Well, Kevin, I I tell you, in 94, I felt invincible. I felt... uh as if I was on top of the world. It seemed like everything that I was uh, touching was turning to gold. I do know that it did not come without a price. I have a, and still to this day, have a um, super ultra competitive work ethic, uh, relentless. That's kind of how I would describe myself. Uh, never stop working no matter what. D- do not like to try to put off anything um, that I can do today. I always try to accomplish things, set goals, and accomplish those goals on a daily basis. So I felt so good about myself. I knew I had a big decision um, coming up toward the middle to end of the 1994 year, uh, which was deciding whether I was going to start a career Um, In basketball, which is something I'd always dreamt about, or go to college and postpone it for a little bit so I can further my education. How did you originally fall in love with basketball? Well, as a little kid growing up in a family that's full of athletes, I I can recall hearing many stories of my father playing and the the things that he um, accomplished through the game of basketball. It was it was one of those things that he had fond memories of. And when he shared them, it just seemed extremely exciting. When I first started off um, just playing sports in general, I tried to do everything. I tried football, baseball, basketball. I can remember my father sitting me down at some point and he asked me a question. He said to me, he said, uh, Gerard, you know, I'm starting to, um, you're starting to get to that point where, um, you probably want to pick a sport or two and, and put more of your focus in. And I asked why. He said, because the question that I want to ask is, do you want to master something? And I said, sure. It sounds really cool to be a master of something. Um, when I was growing up, I used to watch martial arts a lot, karate and Bruce Lee movies and stuff like that. So I wanted to be a master at something just like Bruce Lee. So I chose uh, basketball since I was growing at such a fast clip, and I thought basketball would be um, something I can really excel at, and um, I did. You touched on your relentless work ethic earlier. I've read about you that your dad was really influential in helping to support you, but you were putting in the work with him, and I'm sure without him late into the night a lot of times and doing all that stuff, you know, the the part of the iceberg that's beneath the water line that nobody sees, right, Gerard? What I'm curious about is how you balanced the discipline to continue to put the work in with whatever you're doing and no matter how much you love it, you've got to work and, and you're not always going to feel like doing the work, but also maintaining that love and that spirit and trying to balance the two. What did that look like for you? Well, I'll tell you, it's really easy when you tap into your passion. And so I felt as time progressed, after I chose basketball um, over all the other sports, that it was the reason why I chose it, because I loved it more than the others. And so it did not ever seem like 
I was forced to do uh, anything. I was forced to practice. It didn't feel like I was pressured because I really enjoy spending time with um, the game of basketball with my father in, in that regards as well. I tell you, I will say this. When you love something, you never, ever want to be without that. It's, it's like you always want to have whatever it is that you love so dearly around you or be able to touch it or tap into it. And so that's kind of what I did with basketball. To what extent did you have other interests during that time? I mean, up through the high school years. Well, just as a kid growing up, you, you try your hands into everything. I Great uh, parents, mother and father, who allowed me to experiment as far as the different sports are concerned. Um, but as I continue to grow, let me, let me just kind of set up a little bit how I was growing. So I can recall at the age of 10 years old, I believe I was in the fifth grade and I was just over five feet tall. By the time I uh, reached sixth grade, I was almost five, five, a little bit over five, five. Um, Seventh grade, I had grew to six feet. Eighth grade, I was six, two, almost six, three. Ninth grade was six, four, six, five. And by my sophomore year in high school, I was six, seven. And then the few more inches I uh, grew after that. So now I stand at six, nine and a little bit of change. So as you can see, I was growing at such a fast and average pace. It was fairly easy for me to decide that basketball was definitely the sport of choice because when I was playing football, there was so much of my body that was a target and I just didn't want to uh, place myself in situations to get seriously injured. And the same thing with track. Growing, when I grew up, we did not have the long baggy shorts. We had these little short shorts, so it did not really look appealing for someone being so tall in little short shorts. <laughs> you're, you're, drawing, you're drawing me back into the 80s and the Larry Bird, the Magic Johnson era, and maybe even before. Absolutely. Yeah, those were the days, the good old days. Uh, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe yeah. Anyway, we won't. <laughs> I won't follow you down the path of uh, of wardrobe. But you gave me a visual that I'm trying to shake here now, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say um, I'm, I'm a firm believer, and this is something that uh, has stuck with me. And Michael Jordan kind of uh, airs and thinks along the same lines. If you look sweet, you play sweet. So I felt that I needed to look more presentable, and I couldn't do it in with any other sport. What I was wondering, or what came to mind when you were describing that incredible rate of growth that you're going through, is how, if at all, that affected your ability to to acquire the skills that you were working so hard at, uh, in this case with basketball, Gerard, that, I mean, your balance is changing, your body is changing, your your angle to shoot, everything is, is a moving target. How did that affect your mm-hmm. your, your skill improvement? Well, it goes back to that one word that I started off is when I describe myself, at my work ethic, which is relentless. I would spend countless hours working on my craft, and my parents would also allow me to do so because of the, we had like a small contract that we had struck. And the deal was, when I finally decided that I wanted to play basketball full, full time and make that my sport of choice, part of the deal was I needed to get good grades. I must maintain a certain uh, GPA. And if I didn't, then I wouldn't be allowed to play basketball. So I was working extremely hard in the classroom so that I can obtain the things that I needed to play basketball. And what was funny about this whole story, I said, Dad, I need a few things. He said, okay, what do you need? I explained, I need shoes. I need, the say, like the new George's. I needed those. Or I needed... Uh, uh, a certain basket with the pole a certain way and I needed to be positioned a certain way. So I was, I told him the things I thought I needed. He said, I agreed to doing all of that. Just make sure you maintain the grades. So I, as I brought home my report cards, my dad would look at him. He'd give me the thumb of approval. But the funny thing about this story was I did not get everything I needed all at once. It came bit by bit. So first time I may have gotten some shoes and some clothes so I said dad okay I have shoes and clothes now what about the ball what about the gold (laughs) what about everything else so then later 
I bring home another report card. So then I get just the basket, just the basket itself with no backboard, no support, no uh, pole support, nothing. I'm like, Dad, what am I supposed to do with just the basket with no nets? He said, well, let's go out here and let's uh, place it on a tree. I'm like, a tree? So every time I bring home a report card, every time I bring home the good grades, I held my end of the bargain in the classroom. He would uphold his end of the bargain on the other side, and I'll get one more piece. So then I eventually got the backboard and the nets, the pole. We eventually placed it in the ground. And so I had the full half-court uh, basketball at my disposal so I can work on my craft. But it taught me a very valuable lesson that when you ask for something, don't automatically think you're going to get it all at once. It takes a lot of work and dedication and effort to be put in so that things can happen the way they should happen. And so that's the reason why I worked so hard, because I was working so hard towards getting the things that I felt I needed to continue to improve myself on an individual level. I'm trying to decide about whether I want to ask a little bit more about your dad or get us back to kind of where we started in 94. Let me ask about your dad for just a moment. I'm curious about what the rest of his life looked like, if if you don't mind sharing, Gerard. What was he doing for a living? And uh, I'm I, when what I'm trying to get at is how he had the insight to be able to exhibit that amount of character and in the patience, I guess, to to guide you through that process. Where do you think that came from for him? Well, my dad started off working in the automotive industry. Um, due to some complications with his legs. Uh, my dad suffered from varicose veins really bad, and he needed to have an operation, had the operation where they uh, needed to replace some um, some veins with some artificial ones. He was left bedridden and was told that he would never, ever walk again. And for years, we took care of him. For, I want to say, about a year and a half, we took care of him. Um, And I watched him suffer, but I also watched him pick himself up because of his desire to get back up so he can uh, get out and teach myself, my other siblings, just different things about life. And that really, really stuck with me throughout my my life and it it still sticks with me today. How not once did I see him cry or complain about a situation that he was always pushing himself to try to do better. And he did not depend on anyone, even though we were trying to do everything we could to alleviate any pain that he may have been having. He was constantly trying to do it himself. So that just kind of helped steal a a, a certain type of work ethic in me. And when he finally was able to to get up uh, and started walking again. Uh, shortly after he started to run and he did not take any moment for granted because it was told that he wouldn't be able to do this again. So he, when he had the time to spend with us and show us things and impart life lessons in, in, into us, he did so. And I'm extremely thankful and proud and grateful to have a father that was so invested. And my mom was there as well, but you know, it, it's, it's one thing when a son can have a role model right in the home that he does not have to seek out. Uh, it, it's really profound. Thank you for sharing that, Gerard. I, I can't stress how important I think that is for people to hear. I've got two kids, and one of the things that I've learned is some of the things that I initially thought, Gerard, would were things that I was either ashamed of or embarrassed about or that might on the surface look like failure or hardship, it's easy to forget our kids are watching. And sometimes it's a better lesson when they see you. You you said that you watched him suffer, but you also watched him get up. I watched him rise, yes. You know, and um, I think sometimes just as people, we, we, we forget that our kids are watching, other people are watching, and that we have a lot more influence on the the people around us than we may think we do. And what you just described about your dad foreshadows a little bit of your own story, but we're uh, we're going to get to that. Um, let's go back to 94. 
I, and I know I'm skipping over a lot, but I'm curious about what it's like. Obviously, you would have had to have a lot of confidence. You're putting the work in. You've got a great support system. It's clear that you're you're being given some great examples to, to follow and, and learning some good lessons. But now, all of a sudden, to give people a bit of context, I'm not sure how many millions of people play basketball just in the United States, let alone around the world, but now, all of a sudden, here you are. I know what I was like when I was a high school kid, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a lot of things that I wish I could go back and do over again. Or if I'm honest about, you know, what my worldview was or level of maturity, I don't know how anybody handles a, a massive amount of tension when it's all of a sudden placed on, on you when, when you're that age. But what was your life like and how did it change when all of a sudden you're recognized as the top player of your age in the entire country? How did that change your world? Well, the pressure was the pressure was tough when 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 it first started out. It's one of those things. Um, it's exciting, but at the same time, it's um, taxing. So you always felt as if you needed to live up to someone else's expectation, and by doing that, you tried your best to just be an example for every single person that you came in contact with, and then those that you don't come in contact with. But it took away some of your childhood. You weren't able to go out and hang out with your friends as often as you wanted to play some of the games that they may get involved in. You were constantly trying to be a role model. So even at the age, and let's talk just a little bit before 94, even at younger ages when I'm uh, uh, in middle school, I'd become such a role model for others around me. And it wasn't just kids. It was adults. Uh, businessmen, everyone was looking up to me, just literally looking up to me, but at the same time looking up to me because of this unique talent and ability that, that God had stored upon me. So it was it was tough to, to kind of sacrifice um, some of your childhood, a lot of your childhood, just to do something really, really great. Tell me more about what that was like. You, you described it when we started as that you felt invincible, but you're also telling me about what sounds to me like a lot of really heavy responsibility. How how much do you remember about being aware of external expectations at that time? Well, you're aware of it when you're younger, just because you can hear all the chatter, all the talk. Um, you're very impressionable. As I continued to mature and grow, those things became less um, important to me. I could I could block them out easier. So by the time I had reached the level of becoming the National Naismith Player of the Year, I was so confident that I, I, I erred very closely on the side of uh, arrogance because I think in order to be great at something, I mean, truly great, not just, you know, great, but truly great, meaning you stand out above all the rest. You must um, kind of walk that thin line. And so I did so, and I did it very carefully because I had a great supporting cast, but I did so, um, and I think I did a good job at it at that time. I can recall having some conversation with some college coaches that was recruiting me, and I lived in Mississippi. I'm from Mississippi, so that's not typically your basketball mecca. That's not where the best basketball players normally come from. Now, if we were talking New York, we were talking Los Angeles, or we were talking Chicago, then I'm in the right place if I'm a basketball player. So I was constantly hearing that I should move away from Mississippi so that my stock could increase uh, because I'm a very talented player. I took that personally. I said to myself, why do I need to move? If you're saying uh, out of one side of your mouth that I'm a very talented player, then why can't you give me the accolades that I needed? Why can't you rank me where I should be? So I took that very personal and it was something I use as a motivational tool to drive me to becoming the best player in, in, at that time in the country. The com one of the conversations with one of the coaches, um, and we I've spoken with him recently, and we've laughed about it. He said, do you remember back in 94 when you told me 
that um, one of the events that we were having. So we have these national events, and we had this event called the Fab 40, which was uh, located in Beaverton, Oregon. And he said, Coach, please don't miss this event. And you were very, very uh, adequate about me not missing the event. And, and I said, yeah, I remember. He said, and you told me out of your mouth, you said, because it's after this event, there's not going to be a doubt in anyone's mind who's the best player in the country at that time. Now, the event was called the Fab 40 because we were bringing the best, quote, 40 players from around the world to one location, and we were just going to battle it out for the top spot. We had the top players from the senior class, junior class, and, and sophomore class. Just to name a few people, Kevin Garnett was there. Um, Felipe Lopez was there. Antoine Walker was there. Just to name a few players, and the list goes on and on and on. Stephon Marbury. So all of these guys were there, and we were all on the were divided up and some of us was on the same team. I can remember Stefan was our point guard uh, on that team. Felipe was our uh, two guard. I was the three guard. Danny Forson was the four. And we had a Donald Foyle as our five. Now, everyone I've mentioned has gone on to play in the NBA. All five players have had some experience in the NBA. That's how good that team was. Um, and then there were other teams just as good because I mentioned Kevin Garnett and, and Antoine Walkers and others. First game, I go out and score 37 points. It seemed like I'm just red hot. The last few shots, um, I'm driving strong to the basket. The last few, I just dr was drilling three. So I want to say I finished about seven out of ten threes were made. Second game started off. And I wasn't getting the same opportunities, couldn't get involved as much as I wanted to. Around halftime, I believe I had only three points. After halftime, I come out and I was able to get more involved in the game. I finished with 43 points. And the last few shots, I shot the ball from long range deep with my left hand to just show that I'm ambidextrous. I can, I can do it with either hand. Left there in every scout mind, um, every reporter, everyone who was there evaluating the talent, the talk was by far, I'm probably the best player in the class. And that's when things just kind of took, started to go to a whole nother level for them. So when you're named Naismith Player of the Year, tell me what that's like in terms of the phone calls, the letters, everybody that's... And maybe this had started to happen before that, but at whatever point that you set the, the stage where already you were being told you got to come out of Mississippi, well, now I'm imagining you must have heard from every school in the country. What was it like? It was, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, every school, as you mentioned, in the country was, was seeking uh, an opportunity to speak to me, to, to recruit me, uh, and I was, I was, you know, soaking it all in. I knew it was going to be a tough decision, but I also had another decision to make because there was an opportunity for myself to skip college and go directly into the NBA. Um, and that's something that hadn't been done probably for almost 30 years, 30 years plus. And I want to say Moses Malone at that time was the last person to uh, do so. So it was very tough. It was it was one of those decisions that took a lot of uh, thought. Uh, it wasn't easy and lightly made. But at the end of the day, I chose to uh, attend the University of Michigan. And why Michigan? Well, it seemed like a perfect fit for the uh, best player in the country. There, there's a great academic school. Athletics was on the top of the world as far as basketball is concerned and the other sports was doing quite well as well but they had just gone back to back with two national championships and, and came up with just a bit short and I you know I felt that I could be one of the missing pieces that would just come in and help the team you know get over that hump and help coach Fisher finally win the national championship that's when all the misfortune uh, started for me health wise so what was the first 
big adversity that started to show you that this was not going to go the way that you and probably everybody that follows the uh, the Michigan basketball program was hoping it was going to go? Well, about midway into my freshman season, in a game versus our biggest rival, Michigan State, I was coming off the screen to catch the ball, and I felt a sharp stab in my right knee. Immediately I collapsed. Players, coaches, trainers, everyone rushed to my aid to see if I was okay. And after all the tests, uh, I was told that I had torn my meniscus and I was going to need to have it surgically repaired. So it was the first time in my life that I was about to not be able to do something that I love to do for so long. And I was I was extremely good at it. Um, you can imagine the thoughts that were going through my mind. I felt uh, all different types of emotion. Never once did I think to myself, I should cry about it. I was more angry that what was going on was actually happening and that maybe somehow, some way I could have prevented it. So that was the first and that was my freshman year about 20 games into the season. Not even nine months or so later, beginning of my sophomore season, in a game versus uh, Washington State, strong drive to the basket. After I felt as if my left knee just exploded. This, this was like a pain that I'd never, ever, ever felt before in my life. Even the first knee injury did not feel the same way that this one did and I knew at that time this was much worse than the first after being evaluated once again I was told I had torn my ACL and it was going to take uh much longer to recover it was going to take almost a year to recover now granted back in those days this was something that had possibly taken people out and ended their career, um, ACL injuries. So I knew I was going to have an uphill battle, and I needed to dig really deep inside to try to coach myself back to the top. And that's kind of when I started form, when I formed uh, an acronym called E-Diversity, because those three letters meant something totally different to me than possibly anyone else could think or even thought at that time. And I wanted to make sure that I did it the right way. So I started eating adversity. So here we come back around to you'd seen somebody get up before. <laughs> you know, with the, the stories that you told about your dad. Mm-hmm. So you at least knew that that was an option and, and, and doable by somebody very close to you that you had observed and participated with. But tell me more about the mental and the emotional side. I mean, we're looking back on this through the benefit of hindsight and, and you know, you've got a lot of, of, of road and life between that time and the Gerard Ward that's talking to me right now. But you're you're probably dreaming of the NBA. You would have had every reason to think that that would, would be a dream that would be fulfilled. You talked about having even considered just jumping right from high school to the NBA. One of the people that you mentioned at that uh, Fab 40 event, Kevin Garnett, did exactly that. So you're, you're aware of all of that. Now you're on the, the campus of one of the, the greatest schools in the country, one of the best basketball programs, and, and you're not only on the sidelines, but you've got injuries that other people are telling you may make it so that, that your whole dream of your life is – not just going to put you back on the court at Michigan, but that, that that whole dream is perhaps gone forever. What's it like even trying to be on a campus, looking other people in the eye, listening to the questions? It's, you know, again, to get people in the mind, you're a college age, you're a kid at this point, Gerard. What was it like? It was tough, just, you know, trying to get yourself up on a day-to-day basis. I remember... 
the first ACL, because this that was just the start of my adversities. I would go on in a short amount of time, which was four years, and accumulate five surgeries, five major surgeries in four years. The worst of the surgeries will come my senior year, which we haven't talked about yet. But just to tell you what it was like initially, it's totally different than watching someone go through a, a struggle and able to pick themselves up as if just like I watched my father, I watched him battle, I watched him rise and, and be able to go on and do something that he was told not to do. But when it's yourself and you're told that the probability of you doing something you have long to do your entire life you're prepped your entire life and something just two years prior to this point you could have actually done it it was it was right in your grasp so the the idea of me playing in the nba was was a foreshadow um, before i even entered school there was articles upon articles written that my future, when they wanted to forecast the future, was definitely the NBA. I mean, this is from people who watch basketball on a yearly basis and who scout players and who understood the game of basketball and talent. And there was a mock draft that came out that had me going in a lot in the lottery coming out of high school. And the headliner in that 94 draft was Glenn Robinson from Purdue. You had Grant Hill. Um, you had Jalen Rose, Juwan Howard from Michigan. So for me, even be considered to go in the lottery potentially with those guys was tremendous. And I'm only 16, 17 years old. Fast forward two years, being told that before injury, chances of people making it to the NBA are 0 0.3. And now my chances have just gotten even slimmer. You can imagine how I felt. I was overcome with emotions, but yet again, I never allowed myself to break down and just cry, even though I felt helpless to some degree. And it was it was hard, you know, walking around class, uh, going trying to go to class, or walking around school trying to go to class, and you can you can almost hear the whispers, even though you obviously can't hear whispers from afar, but you can almost hear them because the eyes, the, the way people were looking at me uh, in, in, in a way that I was a disappointment or I haven't lived up to the billing. And all I could think in my mind that I just wanted an opportunity to show people and to prove that I am who they said I was. But even more, I wanted to be able to help our team and Coach Fisher win a national championship. Because that's part of the reason why I chose Michigan. The other aspect I'm thinking of, there's a, a bit of an irony in that you've come around to serve as an analyst for, for ESPN and, and others. But I'm thinking again about that college age kid, Gerard, that to try to give some more context and paint the picture for someone who's listening right now, it's one thing to knock, get knocked down and then get back up and do that if you choose to do that at all within your inner circle of friends and family, it's another, I think to choose to do that or not. And in your case to do that, when you've got the ESPNs and the national media and the, for people that may be outside of the United States that might not necessarily understand just how important U S college basketball is to the school to the country, to sport fans in general, that it's not just you trying to decide to get back up and get going again and, and keep that pilot light of your dream lit somehow. But but what is it like to do that when you know you're being talked about, analyzed, predicted upon with all these media outlets and newspapers and uh, online wasn't as, as big a thing so much then, but still a lot of voices lending opinions about what you should do or what you shouldn't or what was going to happen and what wasn't. How did you manage that? As I mentioned, it was extremely, extremely tough. 
um, I needed to really do a lot of soul searching. I needed to dig deep. I needed to find something that I can grab onto that had signs and glimmer of positiveness. Um, and I try to surround myself with positive people. Now, here's the problem. When I was considered the best player uh, at the time in the land, I was there was no shortage of friends, family members, phone calls, uh, people just wanting to spend time with you and be around you and talk to you. Second injury, and it was so close in proximity, everything ceased. It was as if I was wiped off the planet and I almost didn't exist outside of my immediate family. The phone was not ringing. It's hard to get people to want to be around you on a, on a daily basis, talk to you. It was almost as if it, I was contagious and no one wanted to catch what I had. It was a very lonely, lonely place to be. I can recall being in my, my uh, apartment all alone, feeling isolated from the world, just in thoughts, trying to figure out exactly how I'm going to be able to continue on with this journey and make it a reality. At that time, I had absolutely no clue. I just tried my best to, to gravitate and, and lean on the fact that everything happens for a reason even though I did not know the reason why I was go why I was going through this. I tried to hold on to that. And slowly but surely, I started climbing out of that deep, dark place that it felt cloud, that felt like it was over me. And I started working myself back to a, a place where I could actually breathe. It's almost like the air was taken away from you and someone was trying to suffocate you. And it, and it stayed that way. Um, for a stretch there, I had completely stopped celebrating my birthday. The reason why was I, in choosing Michigan, it was done on my 18th birthday. So that was the day that I made this big decision whether I was going to go to college, I was going to try to pursue my uh, NBA dream by trying to enter the draft. And it had become a very dark day, dark cloud, and I wanted nothing to do with it. So I can re recall I, I was unreachable around May 5th every single year for a great stretch. I wanted nothing to do with that day. I just wanted to forget all about it. It ever happened because I was battling internally with myself, but also trying to, to maintain my wits. Uh, and, and, and stay positive and tap into uh, that part of everything happened for a reason. Eating adversity, the acronym EAT, had become even more important to me and going through the different steps that each one of those letters meant. Tell me what those are. Well, I start with E and it means embrace. I had to find ways and a way to just stop beating myself up. I had to stop telling, asking the question, why me? And I need to stop beating myself up because you cannot move forward looking back. And that's all I was doing at that time. I was reflecting on previous conversations, things that was potentially could have happened I mean, I was reflecting on a conversation I had with Kevin Garnett when I was in high school and he, we were good friends. And he was asking, he said, Gerard, you know, if I'm in your situation next year and I have the opportunity to go to the NBA, you know, I'm probably going to go to the NBA. Um, I can recall that conversation just like it was yesterday at that time, even now, just thinking back on it. Uh, and it gives me goosebumps just to just to go into deep thought like this. But. I had to stop, you know, asking the question, why me? And I had to embrace exactly what was going on. I had to embrace my adversity that I was dealing with, the adversities that I was dealing with. I had to embrace it. And when I started to embrace it, it freed me up and allowed me to act. So I started taking action. I knew there was something that needed to change. And the only way it was going to change is if I started to act. By doing so, I was able to get focused 
committed, some would say recommit myself to a process of, okay, now I'm not at the top anymore. Maybe I've fallen. Who knows how far I've fallen? Who cares? But I still have the ability, if I really push myself and believe that I can make it back to where I once was. So I started taking actions to do so. And then right after doing that and recommitting myself, fully committing myself to the process and not doing it half-heartedly, things started to turn slowly as the confidence As the confidence started to grow, I started to thrive. And that's where you kind of get that last part of the EAT, which is thrive. I started thriving as I started to develop more mentally and physically through the actions that I was taking. At what point did you, I'll use the word embrace, since you've used it, or at least accept the idea that the NBA wasn't going to happen, or at least wasn't going to be the next step after your time at Michigan? Well, moving forward from that second injury that happened just a short amount of time after the first, as I mentioned, almost two years passed. Things were going fairly well. There had been some bumps in the road, but to but in my mind, it's nothing as heart wrenching as the ones that we've spoken about. Even though there was another operation in there, to me, it was only minor. And Upon my senior year, after I completed my uh, junior and sophomore season, I might add my junior season, I was able when I was finally able to play a full season, the only tournament that we can compete in at the end of the year due to some things that was going on at the University of Michigan was the NIT. And I set a goal to help the University of Michigan and Steve Fisher win a national championship and I was able to reach and obtain that goal because that year we won the NIT. Moving forward, I felt great going into my senior year. Had a phenomenal senior year, probably one that should have mirrored my soft, uh, excuse me, freshman year in numbers. Shortly after, I'm excited about my opportunity now to finally reach out and, and grab um, the opportunity of playing the NBA and, and living my dreams at uh, a first pro camp workout, a first workout with, with the professional guys. I suffered a vicious hit and was told after evaluation, I had torn every ligament in my body except one. And my chances now had gone to absolutely zero because of all the damage that had happened in the short amount of time through the four years. And just to get you back to walking, normal. We're not talking running. We're not talking playing. We're just talking normal walking. We're going to have to perform two operations. I I felt my as if my world had just come to an end. And still, I did not break down in tears. But I did feel a deep sense of letdown. And I felt the need to st- start calling people and apologizing to people once again as if I had done something wrong other than just just living and trying to be a kid and trying to balance school and basketball and all the pressure there is to play at such a high level. My father was in town, my mom and my dad was in town um, and I can remember having a conversation and I asked him, I said, why is this happening to me? Am I cursed? Is there something I'm doing wrong? And he said, no, you know, just relax. Remember once before you told me that you, you, in order for you to move forward, you need to stop looking back. And you started doing that and look how you have progressed. This is just another bump and hurdle in the road. And this too will pass, but just relax. So as I started to uh, lie, I lied back in the bed, trying to relax Um, I drifted off to sleep. And this was a story that my father just shared with me this year. And it's taken this long for him to feel okay with sharing this story with me. 
He walks out the room, and I've never seen my father cry. He goes to the parking garage, and he breaks down in tears in the car for hours. He's crying. And he said, Gerard, I was crying for you because I didn't want you to see me cry. And that was the first time, the very first time that I needed to fight back tears and emotion, kind of like what you're hearing now, because it tore me up. You still didn't give up on your body. I mean, you, the Gerard Ward I'm talking to now has enjoyed and earned a pro career. I'm fascinated with everything that you've just described, how you knew deep down at some level. It's, it's one thing, Gerard, to be, to eat adversity and to keep getting back up. Fall down seven times, get up eight, however you want to say it. It's, exactly. an, it's another to, you know, we're not robots. We're not machines. We're flesh and blood. And to take those kinds of lightning bolts But to say, <clears throat> excuse me, okay, my path is going to be diverted here now. But I mean, I think you could be excused from being terrified of ever stepping back out onto the court for fear that your body was going to disintegrate out from underneath you. Some people, they go through one trauma of, of, of any kind. And it, <clears throat> excuse me, I have something caught in my throat, but it paralyzes them for the rest of their lives because of the fear that they might one day have to live through some similar trauma like that again. And yet you didn't, you didn't give up on your body. Why? Well, I didn't give up, but it doesn't mean that I did not have my moments where fear got the best of me. After my senior year and I was going through the process and trying to get back to full form, that's when I reflected more on seeing what my father went through and how hard he pushed himself and being told that he'll never do something, which is simple as walk and play with his kids, how he made a promise to himself that he will be able to do that one day. He doesn't know when, he doesn't know how, but he did know that and he felt like it in his heart. He believed in his heart that he'll be able to do that again. And so that was my driving force at that point, to to just keep pushing myself no matter what, no matter how I felt, no matter what the circumstances seemed, that somehow, some way, I'll be able to play the game that I love so much and play it at the highest level. And that's what drove me. I'm going to skip over a lot of the story here, but off the heels of what you've just shared, what was it like w- when you got the call from the Raptors? Oh, I was ecstatic. Um, I can remember the day um, I told my agent, I was thanking him for all the hard work and the calls and the, the meetings that he, he had been do, uh, taking on my behalf. And I just couldn't wait to get on the court and just display my uh, abilities and and what I, you know, knew that in my heart was still there. Uh, I'm from a a faith background and I was a firm believer, even going through the process, I was able to finally tap back into it. And what did not start that way, but I was finally able to tap back into it, that God giveth and God taketh away. And that he hadn't taken anything from me. I needed, there were some, there were some stumbling blocks and it was very challenging. But as far as the talent and the gift that he had given me from day one, it was still there. I just needed to believe in myself enough so I can allow it to show and shine. And and so I, I was, man, I could not wait. I can remember checking into the game and I have this actual picture hanging up in my, um, my hall of fame hanging up the very first time that when I checked in the game with the Toronto Raptors, that what that looked like. And it takes me back to what it felt like. I mean, I could not believe that my dream was now a reality. 
in so many different ways. And I had, I've had experiences with a few other teams, but for some reason this was just a little bit special and a little bit more unique. What are some of the other things in your, your pro basketball career? Because, and I don't mean to shortchange you, Gerard, but I've kept you for a while and I do want to spend a few minutes by talking to, uh, or talking about where your path has led you to, to what you're doing now. But I think it's important to know, what was it, 14 years that you played pro ball? I went on to play around about 14 years professionally. I um, was associated with five or six different NBA teams briefly. And then I traveled and played overseas, abroad, with some in some of the major markets that's produced some very talented basketball players that's actually have had opportunities to play in the NBA. What stand out for you as a couple of the things that you enjoyed most during that time? Well, just the the sheer chance to experience cultures and things that most people never get a chance to experience, not not to say at at a young age. So I'm having opportunities to live in places um, that are are, are just – Beautiful scenery, beautiful setting, beautiful culture. And I wanted to make sure that I took in the entire experience so I didn't hold back. I allowed myself to get involved uh, with the community and be as active as possible and try to learn and soak up as much as I could. (laughs) See, it's amazing when somebody shares their story. You know, we don't know when we're going through it. But I think the very first question I asked you where I was trying to get you to, to think back into what it was like being the Gerard Ward, the, the high school version, without the hindsight. But with the hindsight, now I'm hearing about the example of your father, about what, how you eat adversity and how you kept getting back up. And, and now I hadn't even considered Gerard about what a completely beneficial experience it would be to travel around the world and to get immersed in those different cultures and communities and peoples and and, and customs and all of that kind of stuff, and to have that all get mixed together into what would be a really well-rounded, balanced, cultured human being that lands before me now and has been so kind to share some time with me, that that now I see, okay, now we got a guy that we got to go and put out in front of people to share this story. (laughs) I'm wondering at what point along the line you looked at yourself and thought, I think I can help people here. I can use what these experiences have been, what I have lived through, to try to instill hope in other people and and how you decided that speaking and coaching was going to be a part of that. Well, it's funny that you asked because uh, I'm going to, go backwards a little bit so growing when I was growing up since I'm involved in church was involved heavily in church I was often told from different ones that they could see me on a platform the only platform that I wanted to be on was the one which included basketball court so the entire time going throughout the years going through my adversities uh, as an athlete I was running from the things I was told within those walls, which is the church. And now I'm finding myself come full circle and sharing my experiences, sharing my story with people and watching how it affect people in a positive way and being able to help people. And it is absolutely the best feeling ever. Now, I want, I've won national championships. I've won titles as a professional athlete. I've won scoring, dunking, uh, even championships as a professional. But this cannot com- compare because it's nothing more like than taking yourself out of the equation and totally putting all your emphasis and focus on someone else and then watching that grow, planting a seed and then watching it grow. It's the absolute best. Tell me about what it's like, the difference between walking out onto a court in front of tens of thousands of people, cheering, booing, rising, falling, and that that flutter that you get, the thrill of competition, the expectation versus, 
you know, at the time that we're recording this, you just recently gave a, 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 a TED Talk speech. How do the two feelings, when you walk out onto the stage and you're getting ready to take all of that authenticity, all of those experiences, everything that you've lived through and bottled up, and to share that and to give that, as you just mentioned, to emphasize on, on somebody else, how, if at all, does that compare with the feeling of walking onto that stage was the basketball court in front of so much attention? Well, I tell you, it's pretty much the same <laughs> in my preparation. I still have the same um, sweaty palms. <laughs> I still go to my quiet place and visualize myself doing whatever it is I'm doing. So like as an athlete, I would sit in the locker room and in my locker quietly with a towel over my head and I would I would visualize myself playing the entire game out before we ever played a minute. I would play it out in my head. So when the game started, I knew exactly what to expect so that I could excel. And I do the same thing today when when I'm speaking. I think about what I want to say. I visualize what the crowd is going to be like. I anticipate different things happening. And then when I step on that stage, I just try to give all of myself the same as I did on the basketball court because I started learning and I and and started believing rather that I don't know if this would be my last day of playing basketball, but I do know what type of effort I'm going to give. I do know what type of way I want to affect the audience that's watching me. I don't want anyone ever to, to come in contact with me and not leave touched and not feel that I've helped them in some form or fashion. So that's the same approach I take stepping on the stage now. I was so excited to step out on that stage in front of thousands and deliver a powerful message and through the responses that I got, I knew I touched number of people. And so it was the same thing. I, I went out and I gave everything that I had. And at the end of it all, um, lives was touching. And so it made me a proud person. I'm curious about, I don't like comparisons much or either or is Gerard, but I can't resist myself because, and here I have a, op, the opportunity to talk to somebody that knows what it's like to be at the foul line, end of the game, people, and it's not life or death, but it feels like it in the moment when you're there about the, and, and you've got thousands of people right in front of you behind the backboard and they're waving and screaming and they're trying to do anything that they can to distract you and convince you that you're terrible and that you're not going to make it. And for you to stay in that moment and stay focused and, and what that's like versus... <laughs> Mm -hmm. That first time that you step out in front of a crowd, everybody's waving at you. In fact, everybody's hoping probably that you'd be good, but you've got no short shorts. You've got no long shorts. You probably look sweet, though, I'm betting, if I know. If I, but you're out there all by yourself, and it's just nothing but you and, and your story and authenticity to deliver to those people. How do those two scenarios compare? Well, just as I did as a player, I've, I've always tried to be professional uh, in my approach on the court, off the court. And I, and I try to do the same thing when I'm on the stage. I try to take a professional approach to it. The very first thing that I do when I walk on the stage was the same thing that I did when I walked on the basketball. I take a moment to pause and give thanks knowing that this is an opportunity that some people don't have and I need to make sure that I'm giving thanks for that. And a lot of people may want to do what you're doing, may not have the courage to do what you're doing, and I'm about to help some people answer some questions, gain some courage, change some lives in, in, in a way that would only benefit them for the rest of their lives. And then I try to calm myself and relax, and, and then I speak. And the same thing as I did as a player. I'll try to calm myself. The very last thing I do 
And the same thing I did at the free throw line. I always told myself there's three things you do when you step up to the free throw line. You try to locate the center of the basket. Then you want to quickly get balanced. Shortly after balance, you want to take nice, deep breaths. You want to make sure that you're breathing correct. If you can relax the mind, you can relax the body, and anything is possible. So I do the same thing on the stage. What are some of the things that you hear from people after you speak? Just an overwhelming um, connection with not just if it, not not in the athletic sense, but just in the life lessons and the th- different things that I speak about connection with um, some things that are going on in their lives and how there was, you know, having a difficult time in sales or difficult time in marketing. They were not finding ways to get over the hurdle, but the few things that I've said and outlined and strategies, it feel more like they're freer now to do so. They have a, actually have a, a plan that they can go back and actually apply and things happen, they felt. So I was just ecstatic to hear that. And to me, that's planting a seed. And when you plant seeds, you just try to, you know, you sit back and you watch them grow. Um, Part of my talks deals with patience. So knowing that when you plant that seed, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. But if you stay true to the course and stay the course, that it's probability that things will happen the way they should. Gerard, you talked about regardless of whether you're stepping on stage or onto a basketball court, I'm guessing it's probably the same when you're involved in a broadcast, which we haven't even got into in this discussion, but to take a moment to to pause and give thanks. That's something that I'm really consciously aware of every time I'm having a conversation like this. And I'm just, well, (laughs) you're answering this last question. I'm just looking at your name. I've been a basketball fan my whole life. I played when I was in high school. I'm very aware of, of who you are. I remember the the hype about the Fab Five, Chris Weber's crew that came through before you and, and the attention that was put on you and, and, and your contemporaries and thinking about how there's just so much more behind the person, the story, and what we all have to be able to give to each other, which is ourselves, and just thinking, <laughs> this is just ridiculous. That here I am talking with Gerard Ward and we're talking about just really human things and how we can connect with each other. And isn't it amazing how when you just get in touch with your passion and purpose, as you had alluded to earlier, that life just seems to kind of open up to you and it attracts incredible people across your path. And I guess what I'm saying in a very long winded way is how grateful I am for the opportunity to to connect with you in this time and to help share your story. And I hope that it finds people that it will help. I know it will. And uh, I think it's inevitable. You and I are going to run into each other at some point (laughs) when we, uh, uh, when we continue to work at at what we're passionate about. But, but until then, I, I just, I want to express my sincere gratitude to you for, for joining me and, and sharing for, for anybody that listens to this. It's, it's really an absolute pleasure. And those sentiments I echo. It's been such an honor just to be uh, on the phone with you right now doing this podcast and and hearing um, a bit of your story before we started, uh, just some of the similarities. Um, it's, It's an awesome feeling just to know that, you know, when I thought I was going through things alone, there's others out there that probably was dealing with some of the same, if not worse. To connect with Gerard Ward and to learn more about his speaking, you can visit him on his website, www.gerardward.com. His name is J-E-R-O-D, last name is W-A-R-D, gerardward.com. On social media, you can find him on Facebook. His page is Never Be Average 32, so the number is 32, Never Be Average 32. On Twitter, his handle is at Gerard Ward 1, and that's the numeral 1. You can find him on LinkedIn.com slash Gerard hyphen Ward. And again, all those links are posted on his website at GerardWard.com. I'll make sure that they are up with a blog post for this episode at NoSchedulemanPodcast.com. This is episode 66. If you like this episode, you're probably going to like episode two, which was also re-released back on October 24th 
of 2017. It's called Reframing Set Bla- <laughs> No, Reframing Setbacks to Live with Passion and Purpose with my friend Mike Mulligan. A remarkable story about overcoming adversity that I'm sure you'll enjoy if you like Gerard's story. Episode 58, How Far Would You Go? Talk about overcoming adversity. That's a terrific story from John Davidson who walked across Canada to benefit Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In episode 56, Letting Go of Limitations with Susan Kovacs, she was delivered some limiting news and instructions from her doctor at a very early age, which she then decided she might be able to do something about. (laughs) I'll just leave it at that. It's called Letting Go of Limitations. It's episode 56. It's a remarkable story with Susan Kovacs. I'm sure you're going to love it. You can find those in all archived episodes of Journeys with the No Schedule Man on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you'd like to connect with me, I would love to hear from you. You can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. I'm easy to find. My handle on all of those platforms is simply... No schedule, man. And if you'd like to work with me personally, I'd love that. There are a few ways we can do that. You can learn more about my speaking, workshops, seminars, group coaching opportunities by visiting me at kevinbolmer.com or noschedulemancom will take you to the same place. Make sure to sign up for my free email newsletter while you're there to stay up to date on future podcasts, videos, news, and events. Thank you so much for listening and spending this time with me. I do appreciate it. I hope to have you here again next week on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Just a little deja vu. 